The Healthcare Security Cast is sponsored by 3D Network Technology. 3D Network Technology. Reliability is our core value. Visit www.3dnetworktechnology.com. And by Genetech. Genetech. Delivering security strategies for healthcare. Visit www.genetech.com. That's G E N E T E C.com. Welcome to the Healthcare Security Cast, the podcast dedicated to healthcare security, safety, and emergency management. If you are involved with a healthcare security program or desire to be, this podcast is for you. Join the conversation as we discuss the issues that matter to healthcare security professionals while leveraging the expertise of healthcare security thought leaders and experts in personal development. And now, here's your host, Brian Hamilton. Welcome to episode 19 of the Healthcare Security Cast for Wednesday, May the 13th, 2020. I'm your host, Brian Hamilton. On today's show, we're joined by the man who literally wrote the book on healthcare security management. I'm, of course, referring to Tony York. Tony will take us through his career as well as share his insights about the 2020 IHSS Design Guidelines release. He will also discuss industry guidelines, KPIs, and desired security program outcomes. Before we get into the show, just a reminder to join the Healthcare Security Cast community on social media. We have both a LinkedIn and a Facebook group. You can also connect with me directly on social media. I'm on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. My name again is Brian, that's B-R-I-N-E, Hamilton. Also, I've made the effort to simplify things by bringing all of the resources to one place. My new website, brianhamilton.com, has links to all of the podcasts, places to listen, social media, as well as other resources. The site again is brian, that's B-R-I-N-E, hamilton.com. And now, let's get into today's show. Today, we're joined by Tony York. Tony, thank you for making the time to be with us today. Thank you. It's such an honor. Now, I always like to start off by learning a bit about our guest. So if you'll, uh, if you'll indulge me, who is Tony York? Well, I'm a North Carolina boy, uh, born and raised, uh, first generation of my family to go after a college degree and uh, relocated into Colorado back in the mid-90s and probably just as proud as anything as to know that I'm a husband to my high school sweetheart. Uh, Kara, who's uh, seen me through a lot over the course of my life, and uh, we've together been raising two uh, great kids. I've got a daughter, Leah, in college, and a son, Gareth, who's a junior in high school. And when I'm not uh, fulfilling the family obligations, uh, love standing in a river waving a stick. I would tell you I'm an avid fly fisherman and um, love to go after all types of species. Excellent. And you've been in the healthcare security industry for many years. Would you mind walking us through your career? You know, it's uh, it's an interesting uh, approach. I um, uh, was a student at Appalachian State and uh, was going through the criminal justice program when I took a class. Actually, I was there for summer and working and I had my first apartment and took a class that was intro to private security and uh, really enjoyed it and uh, made that a focal point, a concentration of my undergraduate degree and I uh, did an internship at North Carolina Baptist Hospital, which is now Wake Forest Baptist back in Winston-Salem, where I grew up, and uh, gave me an opportunity to experience security inside of the risk management department. And I was just fascinated by the professionalism of it, but also the importance of the role it played. Uh, that led Kara and I to uh, make a commitment to one another to uh, not only get married, but to follow each other through graduate school. I took her to Richmond, Kentucky and Eastern Kentucky University for a very specialized master's degree in loss prevention and safety, which uh, she wanted to come to school out here in Denver, which actually worked out wonderfully for me, which led me to um, hospital shared services, where I spent 25 years of my career. Um, Many people know hospital shared as HSS today. Um, It was originally a Metropolitan Hospital Association and owned by the hospitals here in uh, in Colorado. 
And being their security provider was much different than a traditional third-party operator. It was it provided a really, really intense insight into the healthcare delivery system, and it afforded this opportunity to learn many, many valuable lessons on what it takes to secure the healthcare environment, regardless of size, bed counts, trauma level, etc. My start with HSS was uh, as a crime prevention and training coordinator. Uh, I was able to polish my training skills, and I learned something important in those early days, and that was this force multiplier, uh, this education, and, and how we keep these environments safe. I got to play McGruff the crime dog and learned how to take a bite out of crime. And, uh, you know, and, and, and I should have said, you know, uh, Russ Colling is who hired me, and the CEO at the time thought I was an intern. Uh, so it was um, expected of me to work a lot of hours in the field to help offset my salary. So that was an experience, an expectation that got me an opportunity to work in uniform in dozens of hospitals and see the importance that culture has on an organization, but especially the healthcare protection program itself. Over those years, Brian, I worked um, in a lot of different operational responsibilities for HSS and I had the opportunity to be accountable for a large volume of operations and and have oversight of the security programs and the leaders that were providing that service. Um, But behind the scenes role as well, HR, talent acquisition, scheduling, uh, I was engaged in a number of roles, which um, in hindsight, I think Russ and and George Schill, who was the CEO at the time, I think they were very thoughtful about making certain I got a broad-based exposure. In the 2000s, uh, actually it was in 2004, I, I decided to go back to school. I pursued a second graduate degree. I went through an executive MBA program at the University of Denver. Um, this was when some of the biggest promotional opportunities came for me. I became a SVP of security at a pretty early age. Uh, it was a fun time in my career. I was able to really get involved in innovation um, and, and, and how we keep these environments safe and think about all the different ways in which we can keep environments safe beyond just the people that were providing the service. Some of those examples were leadership development, um, some emergency department specific training programs. It's when we at HSS at the time got into electronic security systems integration, and I could go on, but it was, it was, it was a fun time. I was promoted uh, in 11 to COO and then to uh, CEO back in 2015. And those last two roles were phenomenal. It forced me to grow personally and professionally beyond imagine. Um, but what it really taught me was what is important to every organization and what leaders of every organization have to manage well, and that's strategy, it's risk, and it's culture. Um, so it's been a great it's been a great career so far, and I hope to continue it. Excellent. And you had actually early on mentioned Russ Calling as the the individual who hired you. Now. You're, you personally, you've actually served as a mentor or at the very least an example for, for many of the leaders in this field. Who were some of your mentors and, and what did you learn from them? You know, I've been blessed with some wonderful people in my life, Brian, and, and um, I, I hope I don't forget anybody as I answer this question because the, the list is, is, is long, but I want to talk about a few folks specifically. And I had a chance to listen to Roy Williams uh, podcast earlier today, and I heard him refer to the first mentor of mine, and that was Norm Spain. He was a professor at Eastern Kentucky and the person that um, really taught me a lot about optimism um, for the security industry, but uh, as well as the potential that could be found in this industry that is security. It, it He fed a passion of mine that is still just bright and light today. Um, he was selfless uh, with his passion and especially when it comes to helping others. And I've always tried to bring that with me, no matter what stage in my career is. How do I help others uh, the same way Norm helped me so early? And and even today, he's still a a very important part of my life. Um, There's also Russ. I mean, Russ, uh, I was introduced to Russ by Norm, so I have to make certain that that I share that. But he was the executive vice president of Hospital Shared Services. Many people in the healthcare security industry know him as the first president of our association when it was the International Association of Hospital Security um, prior to the double S's. Um, He's considered by many the patriarch of this industry uh, that we call healthcare security. And, you know, he emphasized to me how important it was for those new to the industry and the old hands alike to understand and apply the fundamental principles of security and protection why 
Also looking for new and innovative ways to create a safe environment uh, for hospital staff and, and the patients they care for. He taught me it was important to give back to our chosen industry, and I got honored to, to write the fifth edition of Hospital and Healthcare Security with him. And, and when he asked me to carry on that tradition, I can tell you I took it with great seriousness. There were a few other folks to Brian, George Schill um, and Wayne Schell. Uh, last names sound very alike, but uh, and they were work they worked side by side for many many years. Both are former CEOs of HSS and longtime leaders. George, 33 years as CEO, and Wayne was a 30-plus year employee, all of that as COO or CEO. They were instrumental in my growth as a leader. They taught me the passion for doing right by the customer, but most importantly, understanding the issues they were facing first. Try to make certain I understood the circumstance through the eyes and the lens of the healthcare uh, institution, the providers themselves. And to follow in their footsteps was without question a truly an honor. Um, an another individual is someone who's retired now for about uh, 10 years, but he's a former IHSS member who actually I hired in 1999, Dennis Parr um, out of Indiana. Um, he's, he's not your prototypical mentor because he was actually an employee of mine, somebody that looked to me for leadership. But I can tell you, he helped me immensely early in my career. I was a young leader. He helped me understand how to navigate healthcare, the security industry, leadership as a whole, and really a very important value of good communication. And, and I could go on, and there are others, and, and especially folks that I've had a chance to collaborate with, with IHSS and in the industry as a whole. There's Don McAllister, there's Tom Smith, there's Kevin Tui, just to name a few. Folks I was able to be engaged with the security design guidelines for healthcare facility. And, and, and there are so many others I could just list out that were, I, I just say, I've had a chance to learn so much from every one of those the collaborative experiences I've had with IHSS. It's just been one of the things I've just taken away is in, in one of the things I just continue to learn every single interaction I have, um, regardless of, of the meeting, the, the focus. And so I consider all my guidelines, counsel, colleagues, mentors in so many ways. But thank you for that question. I, I love sharing about some of those people that have influenced me. Oh, absolutely. And it's it's funny, I was speaking with Lisa Terry earlier this week, and, and one of the things that she said about, you know, being a member of IHSS and, and being involved is no matter how much you give, you always get more back. And I think a lot of those relationships that you mentioned are just a, a perfect example of that. You know, those those, those things are irreplaceable. So true. Um, I don't think truer words have been said. We, we, we don't give um, to the industry to get back, but it is amazing how much we do get in return. And it's enriching, Brian. It's just, as I'm sure you've seen with your uh, role on the board and, and the service that you provided yourself. Absolutely. Now, while we're on the topic of IHSS, and you've been involved with, uh, with, with some industry associations and specifically IHSS. Much of our discussion today is going to be focused around the work that you're doing with the association, both now and, and in the past. Can you tell us about your experience with IHSS? You know, I joined in, in the 90s. It was interesting. Uh, the first week um, I had started my new role at Hospital Shared Services was the first, um, what we used to call as the annual general meeting, uh, membership meeting, the AGM for IHSS was held in Breckenridge in 1994. I think I was the only member of the security operations group that didn't get a chance to go. So it sort of fed this desire to say, hey, why is everybody involved and, and I'm not there? And, and it made sense at the time, but it really um, spurred a passion for me. Um, within a few years after joining, um, we reconstituted the Colorado chapter um, and got it started. And uh, shortly thereafter, I became, I was asked to be a, a regional chair. In 2003, I, I, I decided to take my role a little further on more of the national level and, and joined the board as a treasurer. Um, it was a great experience. I learned what the lifeblood of the association is and what was really driving our abilities to fund so many important initiatives. Um, I was elected uh, for president-elect in 2006. Um, thank goodness it was right after graduating uh, the MBA program from DU, so I didn't have to have great overlap. And I had uh, three great years serving the members. Um, we had some wonderful accomplishments during this time. Uh, most notably was the formation of the councils and commissions, as we currently know them. And second was the formation of the Guidelines Task Force, which later became a council unto itself. 
this stemmed for people who may not recall, uh, actually from IHSS having historical position statements. And Fred Roll, who was a president to uh, in front of me at the time, suggested that we develop a process to update. And when I left the board in 2009, that's when I joined the Council on Guidelines and have been um, a very active member ever since. And, you know, beyond that, um, I, I, I've had a chance to do something at most every one of the annual meetings. Now we call it the ACE, but and that's um, facilitating a, a pre-conference workshop. Um, I started this in 2003, and uh, it, we call it the Basic Elements of Healthcare Security Management. It's a four-hour session, and I'll share with you, Brian, it has given me a uh, wonderful pleasure of interacting with so many folks who are new to healthcare security, who have transitioned into their role as a leader, who may be transitioning from law enforcement or military or from some other industry as a whole. And I've had a chance to really uh, be influential on them and them on me with questions and interactions and a conversation. I've, I've tried to make it uh, a, a process where I'm trying to smooth out the road uh, for these folks to travel. So as they navigate healthcare and protection requirements of an environment of care, that it's it's as smooth as possible and help them with uh, a lot of the issues. But it's been, it's been fun to be a part of. We average about 20 folks every single year, and it's just been one of the, uh, one of the, the, the great privileges in, in my career to be a part of that. Excellent. And I, I do want to uh, park there for a little bit. The Guidelines Council is always developing, updating, and refining guidelines. Now, the two main areas of focus are the, the industry and the design guidelines. For, for anybody who's not familiar, would you be able to give some context as to what the guidelines are? And uh, just the differences between the industry versus the design guidelines. Yeah, when you compare the two, the security industry guidelines are much more operationally focused. They're a little less prescriptive, whereas the security design guidelines for healthcare facilities are really intended to assist not only the security practitioner, but design professionals, building owner reps, and planning leaders and really making informed decisions related to the application of proven and effective security principles um, in in all the new construction, the renovation that's happening. Uh, we're trying to really push the issue hard with some somewhat prescriptive approaches in the security design guidelines that let's address these vulnerabilities up front and the risk associated. And, and early on during that design process, we want to basically help health care organizations cost-effectively address those safety and security issues associated with new and renovated space. But I guess the commonality is that both are written in almost a checklist format that really, in my opinion, is where the true power and, and the advantage of these guidelines are at, where if you're writing a new policy or developing new protocols, you're really driving um, the whole concept associated with, have I, have I thought of everything I needed to think of? Um, we try to write these guidelines so they're applicable to any healthcare facility, regardless of size and, and risk intensity. However, uh, sometimes there are just some things that we are suggesting that are probably not going to be applicable to some of the smallest facilities, but we at least want to know that there was a conscious decision not to apply uh, said principle as opposed to just something that wasn't aware or, 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 or pardon the term, but an ignorance to just the, the the best practice. Excellent. And IHSS will soon be publishing the, the 2020 design guidelines. That being said, can you share some examples of how the design guidelines can be leveraged in a healthcare environment? Well, the, hopefully the intents and each individual guideline uh, is going to reduce the likelihood of missing security features during design and having to then add in at a greater cost after the fact. Um, while we're justifying importance of the security feature during what we all like to refer to as these value engineering exercises that we know go on, um, oftentimes are budgetary driven. But integrating the guidelines early in the design process, we believe will emphasize the importance of a safe built environment. And when we incorporate these principles of protection into other aspects of a project, we are able to avoid expensive change orders, retrofits that are very costly, or other liabilities incurred by the, just a, the mission of applying best practices to the development of, of a safe and secure environment. Now, beyond that, we have really put a lot of effort and attention 
with this third edition of these 2020 security design guidelines to almost go back like we did when these were first developed. Um, multidisciplinary teams that were brought in. And, and I think it's important that the audience knows that it wasn't just security practitioners thinking of how can we just add every single concept. We had architects, we had SEPTED experts, um, we had people who had been around that table very frequently and very often and, and also understood how do these design principles really get applied in the daily life. Um, and it was a great, great process. At the end of the day, I think it was really important that we helped, we believe, organizations and healthcare facilities really try to build their own internal standards for design and in using our guidance uh, that was developed through these gu guidelines to, to really best establish that. And we think it's helpful because, you know, when people are referring to this is the industry best practice, it's not just an opinion oriented uh, discussion. Um, we're not in, in their strength of conviction that comes with having the IHSS brand and mark sitting on top of this and knowing that I think it's important. Uh, these guidelines, I mean, it took us, well, it was May 2019 when we had our first face-to-face -face meeting, and there's just been a volume of work that has been going on ever since. It's been, I'm impressed by the effort and the, and the energy that was channeled to really bring this new uh, third edition to life. It's, I think everyone's going to be really excited um, to see things continued, but also uh, some new guidance for long-term care facilities, standalone emergency departments, uh, sort of crisis intake centers inside of the emergency department or that behavioral ED, and continued focus on trying to really leverage the built environment to minimize, if not altogether, try to eliminate violence in the healthcare delivery. Great. And as far as the, the guidelines are concerned, is there a specific guideline, either industry or design, that you're particularly proud of and, and why? Oh, that's a great question, Brian. I would, if you don't mind, I, I, I can't, I don't know if I can get it to two, but I can get it to a few here. In the security design guidelines, 0202 is the merchant departments. Um, and I, I, you know, I can recall in the earliest days actually brain, having a brainstorming session with Alan Butler when we were working together at HSS and, and we were built out this initial outline for that particular guideline. And then the process that we followed as a task force to really fine tune it. Um, I've seen it quoted often as a best practice, and I really do believe it is um, a phenomenal um, guidance document as it relates to how to create a safe emergency department. If I was to go into the industry guidelines, um, I think 0502 is the security role in patient management. Um, as you would probably agree, uh, along with staffing, it's one of the more controversial topics in our industry. Is uh, and we, I think the guidance provided was thoughtful, and it also provided our colleagues in the industry with good source material for how best to intervene with patients while also making sure the security resources were not being depleted while focusing on what I believe is the greatest risk facing healthcare, and that is patient-generated violence. And there are others. I could, I could have also said 0201, security staff and development, um, staffing and development. There are so many management engineers, these consultants, that are trying to pigeonhole staffing resources as square foot ratio, which I think you would agree, but I know I believe it's short-sighted for our industry. And we really tried to overcome that limited type of thinking with how we approach the, the, the build out of that particular guideline. In a whole, the, the, the Council on Guidelines has really evolved immensely in the last 10, 11 years with its writing and guidance. And, you know, I, I can't share how important it is for our industry, but most importantly for me as a professional, how honored and privileged I am to be a part of uh, such a wonderful and dedicated group of healthcare security professionals. You know, it, it's definitely a, a really strong group of professionals. It's, you know, all the, any of the big names, I guess, in this industry, all the kind of heavy hitters, if you will, are a part of that group. And, uh, you know, I have the privilege right now as a board member of being the board liaison to the guidelines. And yeah, it, it, it's an experience for sure. Another thing I wanted to, uh, to pick your brain about as well as uh, key performance indicators or, or KPIs, uh, they can be very effective if we're measuring the right things. Uh, in a healthcare environment, what do you think are some of the best KPIs? 
Well, you know, I, I hope everybody in the healthcare security industry is giving a lot of consideration towards KPIs. And, and to me, the best KPIs are ones that are aligning with the individual organization's strategic plan and, and the leadership team's expectations for the security program. What I don't like to see is when they're just a justification of existence or they're, they're merely tick marks of activity. I like KPIs that define security program effectiveness, Brian, which means they should be measuring results and outcomes, not solely activity. Um, examples uh, is the percentage of lost time injuries due to assaultive patient behavior per 1,000 patient days. And so we can start comparing ourselves to other industry benchmarks and, and realizing, you know, how do we now level set ourselves to smallest, largest, and tense and start realizing that, hey, these are the outcomes because when people get hurt, that's when really serious issues are happening. And I think it's important that we're paying attention to it. I also think for the majority of folks, their perception of their personal safety at work is a reality for them. So these engagement surveys that we do, I love the KPIs that allow us to not only measure the real issues, but the perception issues that are happening. There, there are countless others, but those are just two of my favorites because what we're saying is security is not operating in a vacuum. We're operating as a multidisciplinary group who's got responsibility for the safety and safeness of so many patients, visitors, staff, the assets of the organization, as well as the infrastructure itself. Excellent. Now, if we're thinking in terms of actually measuring, measuring the right things, what are some of the outcomes that we should anticipate with effective KPIs? Well, we're going to learn how to communicate how effective the security program is in terms that are more meaningful to our target audience. And to me, that target audience are hospital administrators. Um, we want to be able to show alignment with the health care organization and how the protection program is a critical component of both strategy and culture. Um, ideally, we're able to be able to show that although we may be in a little tougher environment as a community location, but we're actually safe and we have a lot of factors are going in. So my hope is, is that the, the nursing shortage that we've been fighting now for the better part of the last decade um, is now something that these organizations can leverage because we're able to communicate how safe this environment is and that we're able to help with talent acquisition as well as the talent retention, which is such a critical strategy for so many organizations. Um, it's important that we have alignment with what's happening. And, and again, not just tracking uh, our, our volume of activity because we have locked so many doors or et cetera, but we can also leverage this information for our security vulnerability assessments that will then allow us to be able to apply, you know, when we're trying to obtain resources for new efforts or new innovations or additional staffing or whatever the, the issue might be, that it's able to show that, hey, this is what we we're able to get and this is the reason why, because of how these key KPIs are, are, are generating. Too many people are using the KPIs as scorecards or, or more importantly, maybe a report card. And I don't know if that's necessarily an, an appropriate way to look at it. I think these KPIs need to be is what's the status of our program and what are the areas that we're really having success with and what are the opportunities that we're looking at. And I like to see these being built out with environmental care committees, but I specifically want members of that executive team to really have an influence on what those KPIs are, because that's when we're going to start having real influence inside the healthcare delivery system. Now, as a, as a program leader, what are some of the metrics that we should be focused on, in, in your opinion? Those that focus on outcomes, Brian. I could say outcomes, outcomes, outcomes. Um, because if we're just showing metrics and reporting up to our leadership team members about how busy we are and our team is, I'm just going to say as a former CEO, I don't want that. That's, that's, that's not something I'm really getting um, motivated by to make and facilitate change. But I think one that is is there is, is let's just talk about staffing for a moment. If we do know we have an expected staffing level per shift or per day, whatever that might be, how, we need to demonstrate how often we're not able to meet it. Sometimes it's due to absences. Sometimes it could be staffing crunches that we're in. But it's redeployment because we have a lot more patient intervention going on and we may not be aware of the seasonality trends that um, uh, accompany it. 
all play a role in, in, in how we keep these environments safe, especially using staffing as our, as our, as our focal point. But if an adverse event were to happen, um, I'm just going to say uh, plaintiff attorney's best friend is knowing that we said we were going to do X and we didn't do it. It was X minus. And that's when they start bringing up a claim against our healthcare facilities for inadequate security or other issues. And especially here in the United States, that's a major concern. And um, remember, I mean, no one wants to have surprises as a leader. I think that's an important component. And so if we're having this expectation, but we're not meeting that expectation for staffing through a number of circumstances, and we need to make certain that we are not surprising our leaders after the fact because the lawsuits come or the issues that happen, we want to be a little bit more forthright. And and I could go on with other examples, but I think this is such an important one because oftentimes we want to make certain that folks believe we need more staff, but we're not really communicating all the services that we're providing, but we're also not really trying to say, What's the highest risk facing this organization? I'll just use the redeployment comment again. It's very common for staff members to be pulled from an internal patrol or an external patrol type of responsibility to go in and intervene with a patient and possibly watch a patient for a longer period of time than maybe our resources would allow for. But we know that risk is in front of us and it's, it's happening right then. Well, I don't want to get in a war of words in the moment, but afterwards we need to be able to track how often that's happening because when we all think we've got somebody patrolling inside, we've got somebody patrolling outside and possibly that internal emergency department officer, and that's what our staffing is and that's what the leadership thinks. Well, when we pull two or three of those resources into the ED, leaving the rest of the house somewhat uncovered and no one's aware of that, even after the fact, I don't think we're doing uh, making a good risk management decision on behalf of the organization, especially those that uh, where risk is such a critical component of, of, of their responsibilities and accountabilities. Excellent. I, I want to actually shift focus a little bit to something that you spoke about earlier, and uh, and that's the work that yourself and Don McAllister had, had co-authored, the, the Hospital and Healthcare Security 6th Edition. Uh, obviously, it's an excellent resource for the, for the healthcare security leaders out there and kind of is viewed as the gold standard for our industry. What was the process like in terms of developing this resource? Well, it's intense. Um, it's 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 a it's a lot of time commitment um, behind the scenes, and not just because of the writing, um, but I would say for both editions that I've been involved with, it, it took quite a bit longer than a year uh, to write and to uh, put together um, the research for. Uh, the material is is continuous and it's ongoing. I don't think there's many days that go by that I'm not at least um, looking through all of the stuff that's happening in our world and seeing if there's not something that may have applicability for the next edition and putting some notes together and and and, and X having uh, that resource material accessible to me later in a process that makes sense. But but really, why that works and what's key to the process is. A table of contents that um, you follow and, and you work from. When Russ and I worked on the fifth edition together, we spent considerable time debating what we wanted to write about, where it should go in the book, if at all. And the framework is mightily helpful because, as you would expect, so many subjects that we're discussing um, in our chosen field they 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 bleed into one another, and so where and how you talk about them and is is a is an important process to follow and you know don um carried that forward with me and let me just say he was fantastic to work with after russ shared he no longer believed he should continue uh being involved writing the book uh, Don brought such a great international flavor to the issues impacting healthcare security. He helped me immensely to know and to understand the issues that we're facing in the international healthcare community, not only in Canada, but uh, in the United Kingdom, a little bit of Australia, and some other territories that I thought were just fantastic. Not to mention, he's just one of the brightest minds that you're ever going to deal and, and work with. I think we found ourselves oftentimes bantering back and forth on a discussion and then say, wow, did, who recorded that? Because now we got to go put that in, in black and white. <laughs> so it was it was it was a fun process, that's for certain. I can only imagine. Now, this might be a might be a bit of a difficult question to bring up because of all the work involved. But when can we expect the seventh edition? 
Well, that's a that's a great question. I wished I could give you a defined timetable, but we haven't put one together as of yet. As I alluded to a moment ago, the amount of research that has been accumulating over the last several years is is pretty uh, immense. Um, it really feels like we should get to work on the next edition sooner rather than later. But um, at this stage, um, I'm not ready to say it's 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 going to be at any uh, any point in time. Um, maybe I'll say within the next five years and, and give myself a really wide swath of, of time. <laughs> it's <a> smart move. <laughs> now, as I like to open it up to you, is there anything I haven't asked you about that you'd like to discuss? You know, I think it's important that we we talk about something that is evidence-based security, um, and probably more the lack of it. Um, you know, IHSS has been, a lot of us have been hearing a lot about a data warehouse project uh, that Kevin Tui and Jeff Young are uh, co-leading. And I think it's an important that we do that because we need the, the ability to compare security outcomes across the various but like facilities that are in our respective territories, in our respective regions, in our countries, or even across countries. Because, you know, what we're seeing is this staffing to per square foot ratio alluded to earlier that the management engineers are grabbing a hold of. And so many folks are having to justify their resource allocations as a result of it when it's just, it's short-sighted. And to me, to do this to offset this, we're going to have to have a tremendous amount of participation from our members and their respective institutions. We're going to have to share something that many of us have historically not been comfortable sharing, and that's our security incident data, as well as other characteristics of that hospital. But if we don't fund it, or more importantly, if as members we're, or industry colleagues, we don't support it, um, we're going to have to continue to fight the complaints that we all have about something I like to refer to as administrative preference. And, and administrative preference is plaguing our industry, and it's why resource allocation or obtaining resourcing is so difficult in our chosen space. And, and because we're not able to prove our thinking, we, we can try to be really good at articulating what's happening in the industry and the why behind our thoughts, but we can't prove it. And to me, that's the, the, the data. And, and, and that's why everything now is still very subjective. And I'll give you an example. One I've shared a lot and people in that pre-conference session have heard uh, frequently, but uh, at least when they've attended, and that's this whole mindset of, of armed security. And, and I worked with one of the largest hospitals in all of Colorado um, for years, uh, and, and they were a phenomenal organization. So this is not speaking of anything other than the issue of administrative preference, but there was a new CEO. I was meeting with that individual probably three to four weeks into uh, their uh, arrival as the new CEO. They came out of a very large mental health organization, but they're running a tertiary healthcare organization now. And I'm sitting in his, uh, his, his office and, and he looks at me and he starts talking about the security program. We had a really good conversation. He asked me, so tell me, uh, Mr. York, why is there all these armed security officers in all these facilities that we have and, and, and across the entire platform? And I started explaining and next thing I know, I could just tell that I hit a nerve and he's looked at me and said, yeah, maybe I probably ought to be a little clearer. Um, I really don't like having all these farms and, and I really want to get them out of here and could we have him out of here in three weeks? And so you can imagine, Brian, as as the officers themselves, um, how disappointing, how discouraging, and just the fact that there was no voice into this, and it had to be done relatively quick. I'm going to fast forward. Um, it's probably six, seven years later, and, and new CEOs in town, um, probably about the same stage. Maybe I'm two months into this individual's tenure, and I'm in the same office, I'm actually one chair over, and individual, we're having a great conversation about the security program, expectations that he has, and it was a really, really great conversation. Then he looked at me, and he said, Mr. York, I just got one really last question. He said, why on God's green earth do I not have one single farm anywhere in this healthcare facility? And all I could do is say, can I share a story with you? And that, to me, got me into thinking about administrative preference because we are not able to prove as an industry that farms do or do not have a positive impact on the outcomes associated. 
and, and I don't want to be a uh, person who's really trying to get into the debate of armed versus armed security. I could say the same thing with metal screening. I could say the same thing with the number of staff resources we have to the type of de-escalation training we're providing and on and on and on as it relates to all the mitigations that we put into place. We have to be able to prove their effectiveness. And until we're able to do that, we're going to fight administrative preference. And this is such a difficult issue because inside of healthcare. Although the management of risk and culture and strategy is an important role for every one of these senior leaders, they're not getting educated on risk management, specifically not security risk management. So we're relying on a good teacher somewhere in their career path or a really negative event which had them learn the importance of the role that security plays. And sadly, those are not healthy for all of us in the future. And I hope those that come behind us are going to see that the decisions that we're making today to create the kind of capable data warehouse, the ability to compare and say, when we do this, these are the kind of outcomes we're able to prove. At HSS, we proved something that I thought was really pretty straightforward, but we actually proved that the continuity of staff, that the longevity of security officers did have a positive impact on the outcomes are being faced. It was not just correlated, it was actually proven to be demonstrated and something that um, I think is now got to be continuously focused on. And I think there's a lot that we can do as an industry because that's what's going to really raise the bar of professionalism um, for us. And I think it's going to make our ability to to argue for and successfully obtain resources to fund the security program, opera, operational costs, capital costs, whatever it may be, in a much better way. Excellent. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. It's actually a, a point that could be an entirely its own discussion. I would enjoy being a part of a panel or a discussion or just listening to others who uh, I think know the data space a lot better than I do. But uh, there's a lot of business intelligence that we can harness that I think will be our future. I really do, Brian. Excellent. Now, uh, in closing, what message would you like to share with the with the healthcare security cast community? I think our industry is really starting to show how important it is to society as a whole. Um, here it is the first day of May when we're having this conversation, but it's the same comment that is saying that we are all been dealing with COVID-19 now for, for several months. Um, but the essential nature of the healthcare security officer and the security leadership team is showing itself unlike any time before. And I, but sadly, we're still um, fighting an issue of perception that I think was going to plague us, those of us in this business, probably for the remainder of our career. And that 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 is just this mindset of how some people view security and, and what it is that we do. And I think it's going to be incumbent upon all of us to continue um, interaction by interaction to change that opinion, whether that's the public that's interfacing with us or a patient or their visitor or the leaders and the staff members that are making up the healthcare community. But I think that starts with sharing our knowledge. Um, as I just alluded to, I think evidence-based security is a part of our future, and it, we have to go beyond what we think and be able to prove what we know. My last comment is is really nothing more than a huge and tremendous gratitude and thanks to everybody on the front lines right now. I believe we owe everyone a profound debt of gratitude to the healthcare professionals, the healthcare security officers and, and supervisors and leaders, and everyone else who's basically, who has and continues to be on the front lines of this pandemic. Um, they're giving everything. And, and I just hope we all model our own behavior on their selflessness and their sacrifice as we help each other through this time. Um, I'm proud to say I'm a member of the healthcare security community and watching their actions and their activities has only done nothing but just inspire me beyond reproach. Awesome. And thank you for your time. I always appreciate the uh, the conversations with you now. How can, uh, for everybody listening, how are we, how do we connect with Tony York? Well, um, I've got membership information on the IHSS webpage. Uh, I'm quite active on LinkedIn. So if you look at Tony W. York, uh, you'll find me typically um, on LinkedIn and uh, love to uh, interact through Messenger. Uh, I can be reached. Uh, I've got a Tony W. York Gmail account, um, Tony W. York at gmail.com. So if anyone wants to just reach out via uh, uh, email, I'm always happy to uh, schedule time to either do uh, have a conversation over video interface or just a phone call, or hopefully at a time we'll maybe be able to have a coffee and a beer at some stage and uh, be able to get back to uh, having social interaction instead of just social distancing. Um, we'll, hope, 
we'll take our time with that one. But I do look forward to those days and those times. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm on board with you there. I definitely look forward to uh, catching up with a lot of people in person. Really appreciate this, Tony. Thank you so much for your time. And um, again, it's, it's always a pleasure talking with you. Thank you, Brian. I'm uh, greatly appreciative of you and what you're doing with this. It's, uh, I have enjoyed listening to all the different uh, professionals that uh, make up healthcare security. It's, uh, it is truly inspiring. Take care of yourself. And this concludes another episode of the Healthcare Security Cast. Join us again next week when our guest is Ralph Cummings, and we'll discuss body-worn cameras in healthcare. Before we close, one last reminder to check out the new website, brianhamilton.com. That's B-R-I-N-E, hamilton.com. Thank you for listening. Until next time, take care and stay safe.